Okay, so this is the first question about fundamental theorem of calculus. It's considered easy level because there's nothing too fancy mathematically. Just computing numbers and comparing and the graph is given. So you can see the graph and compare the area differences and addition and subtraction. So it's uh, not very hard. And this is also a good question to try before heading on to the actual theoretical stuff that are tied to fundamental theorem of calculus. The actual fundamental theorem of calculus is not really used here, but this is like sort of a preliminary step just before why fundamental theorem of calculus is as it is and the way it's written. Graph is given. The question says to evaluate the integral based on the graph. Function is not given. You can see that it's just abstract f at t dt going from 0 to x. The textbooks and stuff, uh, when professors are writing out questions, they use these programs. And when they do that, they actually are plugging in actual functions. Function, so they know what they're plugging in to make the numbers look nice. In this case, you can print out the handout directly associated with this question that we are doing and takes more specific steps and it's typed so it's not handwriting, although I try to write as nice as I can. You can see that the graph falls exactly on these dots like minus one and although it's sinusoidal pattern, there is a function obviously behind this and as I was making up this question, I was testing different functions to make the ones that are very easy to work with and very clear for understanding. You can see this is sinusoidal and I use cosine function, you can see that it's been reflected over the horizontal axis and stuff. Here, the first part says evaluate g at x. So g at x is also the notation that this comes directly from the overview fundamental theorem of calculus part one. So notice it's going from zero to x. And then in the sub parts, this question says, okay, when x is equal to zero, then what happens? When x is equal to two, then what happens? When x is equal to four? So you can see how that's tied to the fundamental theorem of calculus part one and two sort of. G at zero, we haven't really gone anywhere, so this is zero. G at zero will be from zero to zero. And we know that from the properties of integrals, it hasn't gone anywhere, there's no area to calculate, so that's equal to zero. And zero to two, so we can see that from zero to two, this is supposed to be like a maximum value. Zero to two, we can see that the area here is minus and here it's plus, but they're supposed to be symmetrical. I tried to draw as symmetrically as I could. So you can see in the handout that they're exactly the same. By guessing before we actually head out to write these somewhat tedious mathematical notations, we can say it's zero, but why is it zero? We can split between, good point to split is whenever it crosses the x-intercept. Going from zero to one, this can be split as t dt plus one to two, f at t, dt. But we know that it's uh, reversed, so we can say that this is actually equal to minus, this is equal to minus of this. So we can say that's equal to minus of this to this, f at t, dt plus one to two, f at t, dt, and obviously they cancel out, and you know that it's uh, zero. Okay, now next question, gf4. When they ask you to calculate these uh, numbers, they have a strategy in mind. G as zero means right here, two here. So you can see how it's cutting exactly the way it should. Zero to four can be split as zero to one and one to three, area, positive area, and then three to four. But because these two pair up and they cancel out each other, you can see that these two also pair up and they cancel out each other. So in the end, it's actually equal to zero. You can look at the handout for more detail as to how I split the integrals and notations like this. Let's proceed because there's other parts that we have to answer. Now that these three points have been covered over this simple interval, uh, they're asking for the other two alternatives. When you look at the handout that's been printed out, and also in the textbooks and on the test, they will provide the graph on the grid sheet of paper. Because they haven't given you the function, they are not expecting you to calculate the area. That's why they use the word estimate. They're not expecting you to calculate the actual area using the specific function, although you can guess it's uh, coming from trigonometry, sinusoidal function. So, here it's just estimate and when the grids are given, follow the grid lines and try to find best estimate for this. Part two, this was solution for part one. And so part two, you can actually print out the handout and you can see that it was split into grids of 25 squares. Covering this area basically gave about 16.5. So it's simple counting process. And because it's under, make sure that you put negative sign for this. And so this will be G at one. It can be rather that curly equal sign minus this and computing that gives approximately uh, 0 
that's the area of going from 0 to 1. X is changing, it's the variable. And the um, area for this is approximately 2 thirds right there. G at 3 is approximately equal to, so at this point, they have canceled out, so that's 0. So we just have to count this, which is equal to that. So can, we can guess already that this will be 0 0.66 for positive. Counting the squares gives same number, but since we have already counted, why not? Why don't we just say that's equal to? This is actually equal to minus g at 1, which is equal to 0 0.66. That's the area. Next question, number 3, on what interval is this increasing? So this is negative, and it starts to increase the moment it gets added. The area goes above the x-axis, meaning it crosses the x-intercept, and it goes above the x-axis. Then the values, actually, the area under the curve gets started to add it up. It will eventually cancel out this negative portion, and then there it's finally 0, as we have seen in part 1. It's increasing over this interval, so you can say it is increasing. G at x increasing finally when f at x is above the x axis. So it's the domain when that's happening. So it's from 1 to 3. That's when it starts to increase. So you can say this increasing over the interval going from 1 to 3, like, like that. Number four, where does G have maximum value? Uh, when it comes to like these questions where you're required to write sentences, don't be afraid. Just as long as you describe clearly as to what you're doing, then that's fine. It's There's no right answer, like every single word written in the stone. You just describe what it is. You don't have to write a fancy essay. Just very simple, straightforward answer will do. Where does G have maximum value? So by the time it approached two, it was zero. And then from here, it starts to be added up again. That is when the actual value this is becoming greater than zero because this is when that was equal to zero. So that's when it's strictly becoming greater than zero. Only up to this point because from there on it starts to be negative again. To answer part four, g has, we can say g at x, has maximum value at uh, x is equal to three. So at that point, it's the maximum it can ever be. And then from there on, it gets subtracted again. Uh, sketch the rough graph of this. Since I tested different functions to uh, illustrate for simple, straightforward purposes, I used um, cosine uh, flipped over, so negative cosine. And within the bracket, because it's radian measure, I had to do uh, um, divided by radian measure. I, I had to divide by radian measure, meaning I had to have uh, radian measure at pi as part of the component within the bracket for the cosine function. So um, you know that this is antiderivative of this, then it will give you a sine function. But when we strictly, when you have these questions on the test and uh, at school, obviously you won't know what the function is. Just you have to base all your calculation based on the graph. So to answer part five, sketching a graph, it will be just a rough sketch. Um, so here is x and here is y. And one, two, three, four. So when it was zero, we have calculated all these points. So when it's zero, we've got this value zero here. So it's uh, zero. When it's equal to one, we had 0.66, it's about two thirds. So saying that's one, um, that's minus one. Uh, make sure that you draw a graph that's evenly spaced out. It, it helps you when you are uh, solving your the questions on the test. So here it's about approximately two thirds. Once again, these are all approximation. When it was two, it was uh, zero again. So part one gave us answers that were all zero. So see how they're grouped together, these different estimates. So it's at zero, and let me use different points. So it was here, and then here, and then here. And when it was three, it was equal to one exactly same by the same quantity but except on the other side of the x-axis and when it was four it was back to zero again so when you connect these points it becomes a sine function so inverse of cosine is a sine, derivative or antiderivative of cosine they always flip back and forth and so this is a sketch of a rough graph of the given function so it's just an estimate. You are totally entitled to not work with the function because it asks you to base all your calculations based on the graph. So um, this is just a step before fundamental theorem of calculus, but you see where this is going. So also one strategy is to figure out that the questions are grouped together in 
following certain patterns. You can see how going one to five, it's all connected one from the other. So you can just proceed um, and you should be fine working with these questions, no matter what kind of a graph you get.